gold. It was a tradition of writing which had found expression in jewelry and sacred objects which could be read as language. Today, as to some degree, even at the time of their making, these objects are rarely seen for what they are. Raleigh was also vulgarized in the popular imagination, but the explorers who followed him had only themselves to blame for their trouble. These people, they claimed of us, do not have dreams. Distracted at that time referred to a diseased state in which there was a misshaping of mind. We were distracted by them, as I was by you. Sometimes we leave the present, like a boat torn from its moorings, to look back irresistibly, as if from a long way away, drifting but caught. The boat had lacy oars made of gold. It was small like the skeleton of a bird. It was called the airship by the authors of those stories of the Western voyages, said now not to have occurred. Conquered, assimilated, we discovered each other just before we were about to disappear. Good to me the sun because in these margins today bright, we noted. Everything was writing. As objects, of course, we were not autonomous. We reflected the ancient need of the body to decorate itself. A creature seizes and changes its surroundings, commenting on the aliveness of them both. Raleigh seemed hatefully pathetic and childlike in the overweening intensity of his ambition. Still, it was the most useful thing about him. He was not a man given to women like Quinn. He was not one of us. He didn't know the language or the culture except where it concerned him. When he was tricked, he would react with exceptional ferocity. He had gotten to a complicated place. We had gotten to a complicated place in our relationship. It was not possible to keep all the options in mind at the same time. The tea he brought back made of juniper and other plants became our drink. We solved many problems under the influence of its subtle intoxication. We chose our destiny without realizing it. The Book of Kells, known as the most beautiful book in the world, was somehow saved. Produced by Irish and Scottish monks over two centuries, and kept from the Vikings, the English, and other barbarians, it was heavy with meticulously painted golden frames of a language much older than the language they framed. Lola's book, conversely, was written on the run. It went through many versions. Some editions were solid and elegant. These were to be found in the trousseau of the best brides. Others fell apart soon after purchase or were cracked open to the recipes or encouragements most valued by their readers. The Encantada, the Dutchman, the Ofer, the Silverado, and the Mother Lode. A lunch having been taken at a wild stream above Sacramento and utensils being rinsed in the water, a hired girl produced by her care bits of metal worth a month's wages to such a person in any city in Europe. She was pictured with a legend in a colored print. In it she bends over the stream, her gold gleaming in her wet hands which are clasped against her bosom. She shimmered there in the minds of the Argonauts. They walked her and ate her and slept her. She was the cornucopia, the world they wanted. She was the source of energy and belief, the silence, the acquiescence, the material, the touch that could make them know they were alive. She was a name or word or a language. She was a figure interlaced with plants and animals. She produced a design which devoured her in turn. Her colors changed, chameleon-like with the minds of the observer. She elicited an infinite meditation, a physicality, to possess the world was the promise of her drenched, shining form. The eye could roam and fall upon her. The thoughts could go inward, reflected perfectly in her metal. They could see themselves framed in gold. The geographer. By definition, the geographer writes the world. Dee and his mistress reconstructed reality. They built lines according to a map. They built walls. They built her a new identity as queen of the realm they invented. There was an enclosure. There was a first place and subsequent places. The events were open to interpretation. The places were plots. The subject was red. A conjurer blue lit against the walls, taken from local materials, but always red. Similarly, she could read him. She thought he was the source of information as the mountains were of the local rivers. She knew he was a threat. It was not obvious at first, though there was a sheer blueness about the planes of his face and to his eyes that seemed to speak of a lack of fully fleshed presence. 
His ability to be anything was a terrible will which he resolved into a kind of scientific awkwardness. His enemies had generally not seen him coming. Quinn was the agent of D. They existed in different times, but there was overlap. Like Raleigh, they had a relationship with the sea. Their organization was called the sea. The name was not the first example of disinformation, but there was a certain high Renaissance archness to the irony of its usage. There is no neutrality starting now, they said, no other. D had maps of the earth and moon. Any map was dangerous. Maps of old voyages in the new world were among those that were burned at Alexandria. There is no new world. A map can start fresh or be made from a millennium of mistakes and frustrations. D favored these. Light poured onto the geographer's face as he gazed in clarity at it. His were not simple designs. Later, she was almost able to believe the simplicity of her fears. Still, it was an equal struggle between them, one for the other. The white sky, the blue, the feast, the fast, the proud banner. She looked at him with a new face. She felt stripped by his presence. They got down to it, in a manner of speaking, in their first interview. It was not difficult for her to interpret the complexity of his manner. Be to me as you are, she said, as you will. The village would have seemed like nothing to city eyes. In fact, many had difficulty registering that it was a place at all. But to the aching eyes of one traveling for so long, alone, its obviously human arrangement was exquisitely welcoming. The shell in his hand grew warm as he poured in the beeswax, waves and eddies hardening as he thought of his mistress. He set the freshly bright candle on his work table, planning to make a night of it. When they burned the village, there was nothing left. On this map, the Babylonians referred to the ocean as the Bitter River, but this was merely to warn away the uninitiated. The ancient Turkish map showing Antarctica included details of the coast before it was covered with ice. He took her to see the records of this ice as they had accumulated in a language she wasn't able to translate. She drew her hand over the physicality of the old words, the paper. Hang the harpers wherever found, Elizabeth ordered, 1603. She was almost dead herself. It's the last piece. Acts and monuments, their architecture was written. Night comes on. The capital is built like a maze, a fort or a mound, but flat, textual, ruined, infinitely small in detail and interconnectedness. On a ship, a man drinks from a red cup. A dragon faces him, its tongue in his lap. It's the grail ship made of golden sticks, exactly like those that killed people made who used to live here. These objects are not autonomous, but since the normal grid is absent, space itself became immeasurable. She put the calendar up. In 1693, Patrick Scarsfield, watching himself bleed to death after leading a French army against an English one in Flanders, said, oh, that this were for Ireland, suggesting in retrospect that there was such a dislocation possible, or perhaps inevitable, in space and time. In 1799, an impassioned plea was published against the idea of union, meaning not, as now, all of Ireland, but of England absorbing Ireland, as it had Scotland and Wales in its consuming empire. This tradition is evident also in the sense of manifest destiny embraced by its vast former colony in the Americas. Dislocation came to characterize the feeling of being Irish. It meant to remember or to anticipate leaving, to be somewhere else, to have a compromised sense of identity, to be disenfranchised and disinherited, to feel as though it was a deserved fate. In Purgatory All from Nothing, Fanny Howe writes about Ireland as the earthly purgatory, a model for the real world. The Irish are the result, as we all are, of hateful colonial policies. There is a hilarity to their disillusionment and a realism to their hopelessness. Edward Said has noted that the significance of the experience of Ireland is not lost upon other ex-colonies. It shows what can be irre irrevocably lost on a national scale. For women, of course, the loss has been global. The fold in the hill splits the stream three ways. The oaks grow in impenetrable thickets. The roofs are supported by pillars. Bulls' heads or horns are shown in relief above the entrances. Red, purple, and yellow ochre are used for painting outer and inner walls and ceilings, while the interiors are decorated with changing symbols of regeneration, 
vulvas, bucrania, circles, spirals, hourglass shapes, triangles, ram's horns, oculi, honeycombs, chrysalises, brushes, handprints, plants, animals, water, and amniotic fluid, all destroyed. At a certain point, it was necessary to function entirely by intuition and will. This, then, was one kind of writing. These marks incised into the stone were certainly penetrations into the earth, which was, at the time, the element of the deity. There is a monument to those who fought and died in a war. It includes their names. There is another portable monument to others who also fought and died. They were the people who had, in a sense, won. The names are like Braille. Reading them is like polishing old bronze, eaten through to near transparency. The initial surface was a clear sheet of acid. Only the names of dead men are written there. The fate, the scattered, the far, the sound. We get lost looking for pictures of the old language in the pale daylight of a hazy winter morning. We are muddy and tangled in reeds and thorns. We can see a prison and a city, the ocean. We try to read many things which are not written. We exhaust ourselves and stride around more. Later we find a history of jewelry and canoes, ancient pits for sand gold. Sets of bread like tombstones are baked to celebrate this holiday. Thank you. fascinating figure to all of us. You know, I think if you're my age, you, you saw Belinda Jackson pretending to be Elizabeth in the 70s or, or 60s or whatever. And, um, you know, it's an old story. And, and who isn't an enthusiast of Shakespeare? And, you know, she, she was an amazing personage. And she really uh, kicked some serious ass as a woman taking over in a man's world. And so, you know, you feel really enthusiastic about that. But then you notice that you're Irish and you realize that she was kind of like not so good uh, when it comes to being Irish. So it's, uh, it, one feels conflicted. Uh, we're all speaking English here. And uh, so, uh, you know, we share this complicated heritage. It's kind of like part of our, part of our bones, you know. Uh, and so something that is so uh, wonderful to celebrate and at the same time it has this really dark side. And there's a, there's a bunch of twins in that book. There's the two Sarahs, there's Mary and Elizabeth, there's, there's a bunch of sort of romantic guy characters. There's uh, Lola Montez is a character. Is a uh, it sounds like uh, your study led you in lots of different directions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the ropes that you took in this uh, study of this novel? Thanks for asking that. Yeah, it was a great pleasure. Um, I love doing research. I think I'm hearing from Terry's reading that she does as well, I'm sure uh, most of us do. Uh, and it's really excellent to do research with them. At the end of it, you don't have to produce some like, paper or tape test or something. And so, yeah, just following one's um, nose. And actually, the very last part of it, um, we, I was uh, going, looking for petroglyphs because I have this real interest in uh, Native American um, history and their ongoing experience of being endlessly colonized. And, um, Norma Cole and I was here, uh, we're running around Marin, like, we get this rumor of a petroglyph somewhere and then so we climb over hill and we have looking for petroglyphs. I don't think we ever found it particular <laughs> time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, a lot of my, and then we went to Sarah Winchester's house in order to experience that and uh, yeah, we had to do a lot of actual research, which was uh, uh, super fun. Comments or 
questions from folks? Okay, well, thank you on behalf of the Meridian, on behalf of the project.